Hey, Shalom, it's Jacob. Welcome back. We're continuing to appreciate who the sages of Israel were. We just learned who Unkelus, the convert, and why we call him the convert. See the previous video. And as praise to where he converted from. And he's transmitting the Targum from these two giants, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. So now let's get into the source of who is Rabbi Eliezer. So it says in Babli Sukkah on page Kafhet 1, you know, 1a, the front side. So it says, Tanur Abanan, sharpened us did our sages. And they give us a sharpened teaching, a thing that they repeat. Ma'aseh be Rabbi Eliezer. There's a special case regarding Rabbi Eliezer. This is one half of the pair, Rabbi Eliezer, who was the teacher of Unkelus, the convert. So it says, there was a case with regarding Rabbi Eliezer, Sheshavat Begalil Ha'elyon, that he made a Shabbat, he made a Sabbath, Begalil Ha'elyon, in the Galil, the, the upper Galil, I guess the highest part of the Galil. And I don't know if that's, again, code for other things, but for right now, the physical place in the Galil, Ha'elyon, the upper place that's located there. It says, "V'sha'alu shloshim halachot bi'ilchot sukkah." They asked him thirty qu questions regarding the what to do in regarding building a sukkah, the the chupa, the the covering, the temporary dwelling that Israel, you know, dwells in. So it says, "Shtem for twelve of those questions, Amar lahem shamati. I heard of these. Shmona asar eighteen of these questions, Amar lahem lo shamati. I never heard of." The, these questions were the answers to, to these questions. Rabbi Yossi, the Rabbi Yehuda Omer, the sage Rabbi Yossi, in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, says, Chiluf Hadvarim, it's actually the opposite. And what does this teach us? And uh, again, I don't know at this point in time. But basically saying it's a flipping. Shmona Asar, which one is more impressive? 18 of those, he heard, Amar Lahem Shamati, I heard these. I've, you know, scanning throughout the entire spectrum of what's called Torah, He's able to tell you, these 18, I heard uh, these questions and I heard the answers to them. And these, I did not hear them and didn't receive these teachings from, uh, from the masters. And so it says, lahem lo shamati. And 12 of them, he says, I didn't hear of these. Amrulo, they said, Kol enan All of your words are only from that which you have heard. Right? You, you don't originate anything. You see, their questions like, you see, you're, all of what you say is just what you hear from other people. He says to them, a complete flip. He says, lomar davar shelo shamati mi Are you trying to get me to say something that I didn't hear from my masters? You trying to make, say, you want me to fabricate information, God forbid? This is the transmission from Sinai. So he's saying, mi amai, since my days... Lokadmani Adam Midrash. There was never a person who was before me in the in the study of in the house of the studying of the Torah. I was the first one to, to go into the house of study of the Beit Hamidrash to extract the meanings of the Torah, to receive the tradition from Sinai, from the sages, showing the depths of the simple verses. You see, most people read it; they, it's just a simple story, but all of the depths of meaning and the how specific Hashem is speaking. There's no synonyms and all the nuances of a full word, a, a miss, a more missing word, and what these things mean and everything beyond right now. If it's spelled with a vav or without a vav meaning, or with a yud, without a yud, and all these kinds of things, all these secrets. So there was never a person that was before me in the house, in the study, in the house of the studying of the Torah, and of where we... Um, receive really the transmission from Sinai. That's where it happened. Not only was I there early, which is a, a great, amazing feat already, but I never slept in the Beit HaMidrash. Not like a permanent sleep, right? Not even just to doze off for a few seconds. Meaning I was there the earliest and I was up the entire time learning. I never left a person alone in the Beit HaMidrash and I left. Meaning, I was the first one in, the last one out. There was not a person with, you know, with me when I exited the Beit HaMidrash. 
ולא סחתי שיחת חולין, and I never conversed a conversation of mundane things that are not Torah, essentially. I never spoke about things that are not Torah things. ולא אמרתי דבר, and I never uttered a word שלא שמעתי מפי רבי מעולם, and I never said a word that I didn't hear and receive it from my teachers since forever. Meaning everything is meticulous transmission from Sinai. I would never fabricate anything, and that's why he answered them. These I heard. I heard of these questions. I heard of these being in the transmission. These I never heard of. There are answers to them, of course, but how careful he was speaking to them, meaning I, this is not in, in the system that was received till now, and maybe these are to be answered. Okay, so that was Rabbi Eliezer. Just to check on the time. Okay, now, we're going a level beyond. Why is Rabbi Eliezer like that? And who are his teachers? So it says, Amru alav, they said about him. So who are we speaking about? And then it's going to say, Al Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai, the leader of Israel at that time. This is the meaning at a time, not at the time, because that's very vague, meaning at the time of the scribing of the Talmud, which was later even, but either way. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai was the leader of Israel. This is uh, before the, this is when the second temple was destroyed. About to be destroyed, from what we understand from Rabbi Ari Kaplan. You can check the sources again. So again, just tremendous time. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the leader of Israel, it says, Mi Amav. Since his day, since he was a little child, lo sach sichat chulin. He never conversed whole. He never spoke about mundane, non-Torah things. It says velo halach daled amot, and he never walked four amot, four measurement from the elbow to the finger, about a foot and a half, whatever. He never walked, you know, whatever, eight feet, ten feet, below Torah without. Occupying in Torah, either mentally or verbally speaking, ubelo tefillin, and without having totafot, without putting the tefillin on the hand and on the head, the leather box containing the parchments, scribed in Ashurit, the script of assurance, the real symbols of Hashem, of the four parch, the four specific sections of the Torah that are scribed and then worn in the arm all on one scroll, and then in the head, in four separate scrolls, in the four separate compartments in the head, tefillin. So anyway, he didn't walk four amot without occupying in Torah, below Torah, or below totafot, without, it rhymes when you say the word totafot, below halach dalid amot, below Torah, or below totafot. He didn't walk without occupying in the Torah and being attached to the Torah itself. Literally, you're binding the, the verses and the parchments to you on your heart opposite your emotion like the seat of emotions where you feel emotions and then the mind the the tefillin shel rosh and it's divided into the compartments from rabbi zamir kohen shlita says because you know the brain is already where the ability to differentiate between things here it's just all on one scroll but in the mind there are already you can differentiate between ideas and concepts there's much, you know, many more secrets. That was just one thing, kind of, I, I heard. So he's literally a walking Torah being. And now it says where Rabbi Eliezer got it from. Below kadmo adam beveit midrash. So it's interesting. Who is first in the Beit midrash if nobody was before Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai? And really, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai was before Rabbi Eliezer. So this is where Rabbi Eliezer got it from. So it says... There was never a person who was who arrived before him to the Beit Hamidrash, to the house of Torah study, in depth receiving the transmission. Beloyashan the Beit Hamidrash, and he didn't sleep in the Beit Hamidrash again. Not just showing up early, but he never fell asleep in there. Not a permanent sleep, and not even a dozing off sleep. It says Velohir her b'mevot hametonafot. He did not think about holy things in places that are filthy. Again. So always uh, to not be wherever there's excrement or urine, you know, in the bathroom. There would be other things. The sages would like master astronomy and mathematics in the bathroom. To not occupy in the Torah even. 
So he wouldn't occupy in holy matters and filthy places. It says, Velo hiniach adam beveit hamidrash veyatza. And he never let, he never placed a person in the Beit HaMidrash and left, meaning had someone be the last one. He was the last one out. Velo matzao adam yoshev edomem. That's what we understand for right now. But, and he didn't find a person sitting, a person never found him sitting silently, you know, just sitting in the Beit HaMidrash. And, you know, he's not sleeping, but he's awake and just not, you know, sitting in silence. Ela Yoshev Veshona, he's sitting and going over and repeating and going over the teachings because it's really, the more you go over it, that's first of all how you memorize things, the repetition, but also that's how you begin to fully understand it and it's like sharpening a knife as we said that's why mishnah is from the, the shin sharpening the sound of sharpening a sword sh right that's the shin which literally is a tooth which is sharp that means that in order to sharpen something you have to go over it many many times in fact if you only go over it once or twice or even 10 times it looks like you didn't even do anything it's only once you go over it 50 times maybe, 100 times. Now, you know, the sages say that a person who goes over something 101 times is different than if he goes over it 100 times. And not just meaningless things, but obviously words of Torah especially. Because in the Torah you have the depths designed by God that all interconnect and they're all like clues and bits of information to the next piece and they're all pieces of the puzzle. This doesn't exist in secular mundane information. Only an infinite being with all these infinite connections can transmit information in such a way. And Bezrat Hashem, we could arrive to such conclusions ourselves, and we'll see that. Again, the best place to begin is the Aleph Bet symbols, to first even realize in, in the Infinity video, to walk through that in, the infinite being is real. You know, that this, this world had a creation that was mocked and laughed at for thousands of years until 60 years ago when they, uh, they said the world really had a beginning. Unlike the Greek philosophers, as Professor Gerald Schroeder points out. So it says, so not only was he just, they never found him sitting in silence, he was always going over and repeating the entire Torah and teaching and, and learning with people. And, and he never allowed a, a person to open the door for his students. He would always be the one to open the door for all of his students. Anyone who's coming to learn. And he never said a word. And he never said a word that he didn't hear and receive from his master since forever. Since, uh, since all his days. And so that's where Rabbi Eliezer got it from. And not only that, Velo Amar Higiaet Lamod Mi Beit Hamidrash. The time has arrived to stand up and go away from the Beit Hamidrash, from Torah house study. Except, meaning he was there all the time. Except, Chutz Mi Arbe Pesachim, except the eaves of Passover, where you have to prepare, you have to sell the Chametz, or burn the Chametz, uh, really, ideally or whatever it is, as the sages uh, transmit. Ve'arve yoma kipurim, and the eaves of the days, the day of atonements, in plural. Yom ha kipurim, and not yom kippur. People just cut it, things short to, for time's sake, I guess, but the, it's specifically and deliberately in the plural called yom ha kipurim. So anyway, yom ha kipurim, the eaves of yom ha kipurim, because it, the mitzvah that God said is you have to, you're commanded to eat, you're commanded to prepare for this day. And they say, the sages transmit, whoever eats before Yom HaKippurim, it, it counts as if he fasted, whatever this means. But you have to eat and prepare and so that, you're, that you, you can go through Yom HaKippurim, you prepare in advance. So anyway, except for those times where you're needed by your family, you're needed outside to help. But even still, I'm sure that he would have students like Rab Chaim of Elijim literally had a 24-hour shift in his yeshiva because he doesn't know who's out there in the world occupying in Torah because the sages transmit what Hashem is saying. If not for my covenant, the rules of uh, you know people studying the covenant of the infinite God, the whole world would be destroyed essentially. Why did I create the world? Is, is the verse. Hukot shamayim it's Los It's as if I didn't create the entire world, it's going to revert back to chaos. 
so the constant 24-7 Torah study is what was done in Rav Haim Obelaj and probably following in Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, especially on these eaves of Pesach and Yom HaKippurim, it says Rav Haim Obelajin would study Torah because everyone's busy either eating for Yom HaKippurim, preparing, or for P- Pesach, dealing with the Hametz and selling everything, although that is occupying in the Torah, but literally the Torah study, the, the study of the entire system of Torah constantly. And so that's why to make sure that the world endures and continues, not endures, but the world continues safely and has merits even and, and again whoever occupies in goodness elevates the whole place the if you want to say spiritual energy and that's already proven on a physical scientific level dr uh emoto which is how i remember it because like emoto emotions but he literally spoke to water droplets and you could see them under a microscope and speaking nice to plants you know so how much more so speaking to people and everything but our speech is so powerful that we affect the world around us physically observable, you know, as Rabbi Zemir Kwan brings in the, the coming revolutions in English, the book's available. So, yeah. So, he never said that the time has come to stand up from the, to- the house of Torah study, except for these times, and he would surely have someone occupying in the study of Torah as well. And this is how Rabbi Eliezer, one of his students, disciples, Noheg Acharav, is following in his teacher's ways. So now we know a little bit more about Rabbi Eliezer, what a giant he was. And now who is Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the leader of Israel, who was Rabbi Eliezer's teacher. And we have this whole tremendous list of what Rabbi Eliezer was trying to emulate. And now we're continuing to understand who Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai is and then who are the sages. And again, this whole build-up. Thanu Rabbanan, Shanu Rabotenu, sharpened us, did our sages. Shmonim Talmidim, 80 students, Hayulo. He had 80 students. Who are we speaking about? Lehilel Hazaken, to Hillel, the luminary sage, elder. And we'll learn in Otiyot de Rabbi Akiva in the Midrash that Rabbi Akiva transmits that Hillel Hazaken received the tradition from Ezra, a.k.a. Malachi, the last living prophet. Hillel is the continuation from the Tanakh, from the last living prophet, Malachi, the book of Ezra, which the book of Nehemiah is really inside the book of Ezra, but it was split by outside printers who didn't know that this is one book or deliberately did it, I, I don't know. But either way, the book of Ezra and Divrei Hayamim. Hillel Hazaken received the tradition from Malachi, from the last living prophet. So Shloshimehem, so it says Hillel Hazaken had 80 students. Shloshimehem, 30 of them, Reuim Shetishre Alehen Shechina Kemoshe Rabbeinu. 30 of them were worthy that the divine presence should dwell within them, face to face, really, like it did with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, the leader of Israel. 30 of them, Shloshimehem, Reuim Shetamod Lehem Hama Kiyoshua Binun. 30 of them were worthy that the sun and the moon and the whole earth should stand still, like it did for Yehoshua in that battle that we read about in, in Sefer Yehoshua. And then it says, Esrim Benonim, and 20 students were in between these levels of Moshe Rabbeinu and Yehoshua, his, the one who succeeded Moshe. Moshe blessed him with two hands and gave him everything. And Yehoshua was the one because he never left the house of Torah study. Lo yamish mitoha oher. This is Yehoshua Binun who never left Moshe's side and always helped Moshe preparing the chairs and the cushions and whatever it was so that people can come and hear the wisdom of Moshe. Which is not, again, the wisdom of Moshe, meaning Moshe is originating it. To come and hear the Torah from the mouth of Moshe, which is as if the mouth of God speaking into this world. We'll, we'll see, again, these things, how they may sound if we didn't go through all the sources leading up to now. But again, the closest embodiment of what it means to have a living human being, half man, half God, which was Moshe Rabbeinu. 
That's where it comes from. But uh, obviously, to look at the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu, how Moshe speaks and how Moshe acts, and how so-called even claimed gods claim, you know, uh, act, you know, or are, you know, historically recorded or whatever it is, or fabricated, <laughs> however you want to even view it, how they act and how they speak. What a difference between the real deal and the not real deal. And you'll, it'll become evident. So it says, okay, so this is just an already an amazing thing. Hillel HaZaken had these 80 students. 30 of them were on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, Mo, Moses. 30 of them were on the level of Yehoshua, Joshua. And 20 of them were in between these levels, whatever this means. It says, Gadol Shebekulan, the greatest one among them, the greatest student, was Yonatan ben Uziel. As we said before, who is Yonatan ben Uziel? And here we're getting, finally getting into it. Yonatan ben Uziel was the greatest student of Hillel Hazaken. And Hillel Hazaken received the tradition from Malachi, the last living prophet. So this is Hillel who received from the prophets, transmitting to Yonatan ben Uziel, who was the greatest student of Hillel on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. The least, quote-unquote, among them, the least among these students, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the leader of all of Israel, is, quote-unquote, the least student of Hillel Hazaken. Somewhere in between Moshe and Yoshua, is from what we understand based on this chart here, this breakdown. The greatest student is Yonatan ben Uziel. The least student is Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. And I wonder if they learn together. Like, it would be the greatest student with the least student to help them out and to learn together and to challenge each other and, and to complement each other like that. So, I don't know if, that, if that's the case. But this is what's happening here. So, the leader of all of Israel is, quote-unquote, the least student of Hila. Now, it says, Amru Alav, they said about him. Who are we speaking about? al Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. This is about Yoh- Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the, the least student of Hila. Shelohiniyah, he never placed down, or never as if didn't have on him, in his head, right? The entire system of Torah. It says, Mikra Umishnah. The scribe written Torah and the beginning of the entire launch pad to the entire spoken Torah. That's the Mishnah. It's the sharpened teachings, the conden- condensing the entire Torah Shabal Peh into these cryptic little terse verses that are not uh, a finished, meaning you can't read it and just, you know, think you understand it. It's transmitted in such a way, but it's the launch pad to the entire system of Torah Shabal Peh. So it says, Mikra u Mishna, he had both the entire scripture, he, he had it in his mind. Every verse, every spelling of every word, of every nuance, of everything, of every Misora, he had everything. Mishnah and the entire spoken Torah, which is, so, anyone's, it was, it's so hard sometimes to really, to hear it. And it was all by listening. And not only that, so he had Mikra u Mishna and Gemara. What is Gemara? And just a quick ex- differentiation. They're sometimes called Talmud, sometimes called Gemara. What's the difference? Talmud means like the active learning process. Learning and asking questions about everything. That's why it was so taboo. It speaks about everything. You're allowed to ask any question you want. If you're sincere, of course. I mean, even if you're not sincere, you're allowed to ask. But obviously, if you're sincere, any question you can ask. So it says Gemara is from the word Gemar, which is to finish. It's to get to the Gemar Hadin, to get to the punchline. So it's sometimes Talmud is the active learning process to get to the Gemara, the Gemar Hadin, the final, you know, what to do. So Gemara is also generally called for the entire system. And what is Gemara? What's included within Gemara? What's included within Talmud? And here it finally defines what information is hidden or revealed depending on how you look at it, within the Talmud. So it says, halachot, ways of life, how God, how to best move about in this world to avoid all the problems that, and all sicknesses and all everything. Halachot. Then you have agadot, you have these secrets, these being, agadot has gimel dalet, like the Haggadah of Pesach. This is the gimel dalet, giving over secret information. Agadot is telling you these secrets that you wouldn't have otherwise. It's Gimel Dalit is filling in those who lack wisdom. 
and without that, they would have never get that wisdom. Gimel means to, to fill them in what they lack. So Agadot are these secret teachings that fill in what people would never get otherwise. Digduke Torah, all of the nuances and all the transmission of the entire scripture it means Dikduk is the most specifics. It's like the word Dak and Dak. It's the most finest points of Torah. It means like this symbol in this section of the Torah has five crowns. This symbol in this section of the Torah has seven crowns. Like the every detail that you can observe on an authentic Torah scroll, is It says Vidikduke Sofrim and all of the the scribing and uh, the scribal rules and transmissions and mesoras they're called sofrim the sages transmit which is translated as scribes but sofrim literally are the counters because they literally count the entire how many verses how many letters even in the entire torah how many verses are in the entire torah how many verses are in a specific section and making all these tricks and mnemonics to remember everything so that you can verify that every single part of the entire Torah is here as it was given. Amazing. It's called attention to detail is the uh, name of the game. Not only that, but what else is in the, in the Gemara? Kalim vehamorim. Kal is light. That's why we tried to make it light gray. And then hamorim is, is hamur is very heavy, very um, serious. So it's like light and serious. What does it mean? It's more of like an if-then. If like a little person, if a little shorter uh, person can dunk on a hoop, for example, then a guy who's 20 feet taller than that person can, of course, dunk on the hoop. It's a simple example, whatever. But it's basically the beginning of the methodology of the Torah, extracting information. If this is what's said here, then what does that really mean for us? If this is what's said about them, then all these kinds of... Uh, the beginning of the information. Kalva Homer is listed as one of the 32 methods of extracting Torah information. So that's one of them. And Gezerot Shavot. Clippings that are equal, meaning the same phrases in scripture that are used in one place and in another place show a direct link in information. And we understand this today, like if you ever search a web page and then you just do a command find and then you type in words, it will show you every instance of that word throughout the text. And in Torah, though, it links it directly. I guess it may link it in the find and replace, but sometimes whatever, but... Gezerah Shava means that the Torah uses a specific phrase in two different places, and this shows a link in information, and it has to be confirmed by the sages. This is the transmission from Sinai, and not just, again, fabrication of men and people and things like that. This is not what Torah is. As we learned above, they never said a word that they didn't receive from their teachers, and it goes up the chain back to Sinai. The real Torah is you feel it and it all interconnects it all starts to fall together it's you begin to see that this is uh hashem is amazing that's really what the torah experience is supposed to do in the original form that it was given in and the original symbols and the original depth and all of this is completely gone in in translation because they only translated a fraction of what is called torah the, the the whole light and guide and illumination that hashem gave us People only took the scribe written Torah, which is still kind of big, like a big book, let's say. But the spoken Torah fills, outfills libraries. It overflows libraries. You, it's infinite. Okay, and so it says the beginning of all of the methods of understanding scripture and all the ways that the sages begin to unpack show how the scripture is unpacked, meaning from Sinai again not the work of the sages. The sages are the transmitters of, of this information from Sinai. Not only that, what else is in Gemara? Tkufot. It teaches you all about different time periods and different seasons and different constellations and different things that affect reality and time and everything. Not only that, the gematriot, all these numerical values and geometric, geometrical shapes and positionings of the Aleph bet 
and how we see them in, in the world, but also gematria, like the number values, which is completely lost in translation. The fact that two words or phrases would have the exact numerical value shows a complete link in information that you would never get in a different language. They started to apply gematrias to other languages, but I'm not sure if that's something to go by. If God, the infinite being, programmed already that this language would be created with this symbols and gematria is valid in another language. I don't know about that. All I do know for sure is that the gematria of the Torah given by God, these, these number values are very significant. So all these types of different number values and geometrical positionings and shapes and the shapes of the Aleph Bet and the numerical values and it links the image of the Aleph Bet with the number value of the Aleph Bet and it, it starts to link information that would maybe help more visual learners with mathematics and more mathematical people with more visual creative things because the, the symbols, it's the same symbols that are linked. The shape has to do with the numerical value of the symbol. Aleph depicts unity of the two, really one of the same. It's two yuds, which is, yud and yud is like a, two water droplets when you when you they're the same thing when you connect the two water droplets they just form one gigantic droplet so again aleph and bet shows two division gimel literally three done by a third party giving to the poor you give it to uh, someone else and they give it to the poor person so you have no idea who's getting the people have no idea who gave and everyone keeps their dignity as we discussed in the aleph bet lesson all the numbers have to do with their shape and their name and all the information. Again, it's the intersection of all information. They're all links at the Aleph Bet. So not only that, all the gematriot, it says, Sihat Malachei Hasharet, the conversation of ministering angels, literally recorded wisdom from angels that that is recorded in the Talmud. Not only the recorded wisdom of angels, but there's the recorded wisdom of Shedim, which is translated as demons, but these spiritual entities that are that have a purpose, but they don't have a, they they're in between the spiritual and physical. They could sometimes manifest. Again, in the opening pages of the Talmud, again, why kid kids go and read Harry Potter and they love all these books and whatever, just if only again we're trying to restore that, soon you'll be able to read it directly. In the Aramaic, quote unquote, this fake Hebrew to save time for right now full video and article coming soon but um, to read it in the just read the opening pages of the Talmud it discusses you know this world parallels the heavenly realm it's this world is really a physical darker reflection of the upper higher worlds you know and it all parallels things that happen there we try to do here and to reflect and to align really and uh, there's demons how to know about demons if they're if they're present then uh, how to see demons but then also a warning obviously to not do that and then a living example of the son of one of the sages who even compiled the talmud but his son rav bibi bar abaye rav bibi the son of abaye who tried to do this method as a warning for the rest of israel and it says that he tried to do it and he was very stricken by it. You know, he's trapped. I don't know if that's where those movies, he's in the further, I don't know, you know, whatever. But he was, um, it, it affected him and until the sages prayed and were able to bring him back and as a warning to not do this. But it's just these fascinating topics that this is what people want to learn and this is what people want to, are interested in. So even the conversation of demons, the demon king and Shlomo HaMelech, the conversation that he had and the wisdom that the demon king taught Shlomo. And again, because Shlomo was on top of all of the worlds, it says that he had a representative from the angels, he had a representative from the demons, he had a representative from the humans, and he had a representative for all the animals. Meaning Shlomo HaMelech was the king over everything literally. God gave him the throne of God. He, he sat on the throne of God as the verse itself states and knew these languages and anyone who studies the Talmud with Rat Hashem I mean it's meant for Israel we have to understand these things like if, you know can other, certain people learn Torah not the secrets of Torah but again 
whoever is sincere with God and you know this Rath Hashem, the infinite God, will lead you on the right path. So it says not only that, but it says Vesihat Dekalim. Even the language which would be translated as palm trees. He, he knew the language of vegetation, of trees, whatever this means. If that means like now they're showing the electrical currents of the, the, the trees that could make music if you put this app or whatever. Or if it means something else alluding to secretly the, 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 the line of King David that are compared to trees and, and palm trees and the righteous are compared to that. Whatever it means. And Mishalot Kovsin which I don't, I don't really know what that is. And Mishalot Shualim. These, I don't know what that is either. But he knew them. <laughs> he knew these two things. And not only that, but Davar Gadol Davar Katan. Something that's called a great, gigantic, unifying thing. And a Davar Katan, and a small, kind of, separate kind of thing. What is this considered, this great thing? Davar Gadol Ma'asim Kava. The great thing is called the workings of the chariot. This is the workings of the divine realm, how the infinite reveals to the prophets information, real, true prophets. And true prophecy is nothing like we're seeing. True prophecy could be a, a terrifying looking thing from the outside and a very physically taxing thing from the inside. Uh, as Rabari Kaplan writes in the name of the Ramchal and things like that, who knows if God can make it easier for other people or whatever this means, but anyway, the secrets of the workings of the chariot of Yehezkel, that opening of the chapter of Ezekiel where Yehezkel sees the chariot, is the secrets are really hidden within the Talmud itself. So it says, Davar Katan, what's considered a small thing, all of the instances where Abaye and Rava argue, these are a learning pair, they argue everywhere. Not that they argue, but they have these different perspectives and these interesting transmissions. What does it mean? How could the sages argue about the transmission if it's all one and what these things mean? That's enough for right now. So also, it might not be necessarily that they're arguing, but just the different perspectives of Abaye and Rava, it's all included within the Talmud itself. So this whole list is what falls under Gemara. That's what Avachad is properly trying to demonstrate. All of this is in the opening of Talmud Bavli. Even. I mean, in the opening of Talmud Bavli, which is Masechet Brachot, you have every one of these things, pretty much. And why did, why is this a thing? Why did he know all this Torah? Lekayem Mashin Emar, in order to fulfill that which is set, stated in Mishlei, Lehanchil Ohava Yesh Ve'otzrotehem Amale, in order to give to those who love me, Hashem is speaking, in order to give to those who love me, Shnaya Sagiatha, to give them long, healthy years and a long, healthy life, occupying in Torah and God's wisdom, living in the right way, According to God's laws, being healthy, protected, happy, family, everything, and enjoying this amazing information that everything else literally pales in comparison. And their storehouses I will fill, which if that means their heads really with all of the wisdom in the world and in the world to come, the reward for the occupying in Torah and living a Torah life, living a godly life which is again the Torah reveals the, the revealed it's the revealed mind of the infinite being and reveals to us mitzvot which are acts that the infinite being does that's the meaning of the bracha asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav that God made us kadosh with the mitzvot of God b'mitzvotav mitzvot shelo as the Chidush Arim points out in the, in the merit of the Ger so now they're saying v'ki me'achar shekatan shebekulan and after that the smallest one of all those students is knows all of this already, Gadol Shebekulan, the, the greatest one among them, Alachat Kama Vakama. This is actually an example of a Kalva Homer. If the least student knows this entire list of Torah, Mishnah, and Gemara, which is that whole list of things, what is Gemara, then what and he's considered the least student, then the greatest student, how much more so? On one on one like reason, kama ve kama, on, on every one reason, there's so much more that must be for the greatest student, if this is considered the least student, who knew everything. So I don't even know what this level is, but they're going to give a glimpse into it. So it says, Amru alav, they said about him, 
Al Yonatan ben Uziel, the greatest student of Hillel, the one who ensured the Targum of Nevi'im from the last living prophets, Haggai, Zechari, and Malachi, a.k.a. Ezra, a.k.a. Hillel's teacher, the one who transmitted to Hillel the, mes- the transmission. Mesorah is the complete and full transmission. And not like a game of broken telephone, you know. <laughs> you say it once, you don't even care if the person heard you or not, and uh, you move on without ever repeating it again. That's not at all Torah whatsoever. Again, as we said, Mishnah sharpening, going over at least 101 times, you know. At least, you know, the greatest sages would hear everything. Surat Hashem. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai lived till 120. One of the, uh, another one of the sages who lived long and healthy life. So, it's a difficult life, but he, you know, 120. Rabbi Kiva as well, 120. Other sages. So it says, Al Yonatan ben Uziel. It says about the greatest student of Yilel, Yonatan ben Uziel, yoshev ve'osek bathorah, in the moment that he sits and occupies in Torah, in Hashem's wisdom, revealed mind of, of God, of the infinite God on earth, kol of sheporeach alav miyad nisraf. Any, any bird or any really demon, any spiritual bad entity that would fly over, I don't know if it means physical or if it's a spiritual bad, you know, for the people who would say this is, impossible physical which I don't understand why not but this is where the concept of like powering up and having this force field but anyway any bird that would fly over him immediately was burnt up or you could say every bird that flew over became one of the ministering angels of God a saraf you know but nisraf is it was caused to be burnt so it's as if like any but I, I would say off is sometimes used by like demons or by not good things. So any negative force that would fly over him, it would immediately be burnt up in a fire. If I'm not mistaken, Rashid comments that literally the angels would come to listen to the wisdom of, you know, that Yonatan ben Uziel is transmitting. You know, there's so much wisdom, but I guess specifically what Yonatan ben Uziel was bringing to focus. And it says the angels that are seraphim, that are fiery angels made out of fire, you know, whatever would come near would be burnt up because he's surrounded by the angels. And whoever studies Torah is surrounded by angels. And really that's the illusion specifically with the word Gemara, as the sages note, that these are the initials of the four angels that surround and protect us. The Gimel is for Gavriel, the Mem is for Michael, the Resh is for Raphael, the Angel of Healing, Refua, and Aleph is Uriel, the Angel of the Torah and Illumination. So you have the might of God, you have Mika Mocha, the amazingness of God, there's no one like you, Hashem, Raphael, the healing, Hashem's aspect of healing us, and Uriel, Hashem's aspect of illuminating our path. And we're allowed to say these names because they're more... They've already been made famous. Angel names that are not popular, like not already names of actually people and things like that, then we're not allowed to say them. So he was being occupying in the Torah, surrounded by these fiery angels, and you're protected when you're truly occupying in the infinite God's Torahs. And that's again why it's so important to always occupy in Torah, even where we're walking, where we're traveling, to be connected with the infinite one, and we're connected with a constant mitzvah, many, several mitzvot, and we're always connected and protected. To always, and to be sincere, and to really be occupying properly. So now, we appreciate, it went up the rung of ladders, and who Yonatan ben Uziel was, who, in his own right, and he's transmitting the, the Nevi'im, the Targum of Nevi'im, from the last three living prophets themselves. And he was on a level of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, again, the Targum of Nevi'im. And to go through Tanakh with Targum is, is again, discovering never-before-seen footage. It's getting the full details, finally, the full meaning of the words and everything like that. And now it just continues. I left this also in black as opposed to, you know, graying it out. Just to give an example, to now appreciate when we speak about these kinds of things, Mathnithin, in our Mishnah, Mishnah Shelanu, the sages were discussing whoever had his head and most of his body in the sukkah, but his table he had in the house. So he built a sukkah like in the back opening of his house, and he would have to like lean in to eat. 
So Beit Shammai Poslin, the house of the sage Shammai, who was Hillel's learning partner, who disagreed with him on everything, nearly. Shammai's learn. Uh, so the house of Shammai, the school of thought of Shammai, or the perspective of Shammai, said Poslin, this is uh, forbidden. Beit Hillel Machshirim, but the house of Hillel said that this is okay. So now it's just to appreciate, these are gigantic academies of the last, of the students of the last living prophets. It's not just like some rabbis arguing. This is now the house of Shammai who is on the level of Hillel who, is, who received the tradition from the last living prophet. And so when we're saying Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel, and who Shammai and Hillel were, these are not, again, just some, some rabbis from the past, but these are sages that would have been prophets had their had the nation merited and had it not closed when he, uh, Malachi, the last living prophet, passed away, that's when prophecy ended. And that was the year the Greeks rose to power. That was the year that Alexander rose to power. As Rabbi Moshe Shapira Zitzavia, Rabbi Avram Kalimi Shlita says, so, the Arashi Jerusalem. Okay, and so that is now, now when we talk about Unkelus, when we talk about Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai, and when we talk about Yonatan ben Uziel, now we fully appreciate who are these sages, who are these gigantic sages, and they're transmitting it from the last living prophets themselves. Thank you so much for watching. This was a little bit longer, but there's a lot of details to cover. Thank you. All the best. Call itself.